Romans 15. Romans 15, beginning in verse 14 this morning. Paul is coming to a close of his letter to the Romans. And uh, we see that his tone is shifting as he prepares to end the letter. Paul is a, a pioneer missionary. And uh, he reminds me of David Livingston. David Livingston was a missionary in Africa. He was born in Scotland. He felt a call to missions. And he, he went to Africa and he served his entire life in Africa as a pioneer missionary. And he suffered a lot. He suffered much. Malaria, tuberculosis, typhoid. He had a sleeping sickness. He was attacked by lions. But his entire life he served in Africa and died in Africa. And after his death, his body was to be shipped back uh, to, uh, to, uh, to England, actually. And uh, the Africans said his heart was here. We want his heart here. So they, they were allowed to take out his heart and they buried it in Africa. But his body was shipped back to, to London. Um, and that's where he is buried. But he was a man that was willing to go to the frontier where no one had gone and to look for souls. At his funeral, it is said that there was a man that was there and he was, was crying and someone asked him, so do you, do you know David Livingston? He said, I did. I said, I grew up with him. I went to school with him. We grew up together. But he said, I went to Africa as well, but I went to Africa to search for gold. And Livingston went to Africa for souls. And he said, Livingston made a better decision. And that's Paul. He's not, he's, he's also someone who goes is a, as a pioneer where no one has gone to share the gospel amongst much hardship. Now we can see Paul as a lone ranger. When we look and we see his letters, we might say Paul is pretty much by himself. But that is not the case. Paul has people around him early on, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Mark. If you look at the names that are mentioned around Paul, there is over a hundred names mentioned that Paul mentions in his epistles that Paul knew. It, was, it wasn't just Paul alone. It was a team of people working together to make this possible. Dwight Al Moody said, I would rather put a thousand men to work than to do the work of a thousand men. So Paul doesn't, isn't alone. He has men around him that he discipled that go with him and do ministry alongside. Beginning in verse 14, it says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Now, in the previous verses, Paul admonishes the church to bear with the scruples of the weak, to be sensitive to those who are weak in the faith, and those who do not have a full understanding of the freedom that we have in Christ. That's what it means to bear with the scruples of the weak. Some people have scruples over certain foods, some over worshiping in certain days. Paul says those I consider weak. They do not understand the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. You who do understand that, those of you who are strong, bear with them. In other words, help them along. Encourage them to grow in their faith. But with that, with these differences, with different cultures coming together, with different backgrounds, there comes the need of admonishing one another encouraging one another and to have an understanding of how that works. Paul says you can do it. You've got what it takes. You are filled, he says here, with the goodness and knowledge. 
We might think that when someone needs help, take him to a professional, a professional counselor. Well, there might be times when there's clinical issues or other issues, it's necessary, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it has a place. But generally, the church, Paul says, has what it takes to admonish one another. We might use the word counseling. You, as a Christian, has what it takes to counsel your fellow believer. We have the Word of God. It's a great advantage that we have. We have the 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, that's admonition, for correction, that's admonition, for instruction in righteousness, that's admonition, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there you have it. The Word of God. We have the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It is the truth of God's Word. The person that created you, that wove you together in your mother's womb, knows every detail of your life, wrote this book, the Bible, for our instruction so that we might know how to live, how to behave, how to act and live in a way that honors God. So that is an advantage that we have, the Word of God. Secondly, we have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John 16, verse 13, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. What does that mean? That He will guide you into all truth. There are people who say that, well, to guide you into all truth means that, well, I just have the Holy Spirit. I put the Bible to one side, and then God is going to lead me into all truth. No, that's not true. When the Bible refers here that God is going to lead you into all truth, it's a reference to Scripture. It's a reference that God is going to guide you through the entire truth of the Scripture and help you to understand the Word of God and how to apply it to your life. You cannot be led into all truth without the Scripture. So we have the Scripture. And then we have the Holy Spirit who illuminates, who reveals, who opens it up to you so that you can understand it and apply it to your life. That's an advantage that we have as believers. And thirdly, we have prayer. In 1 John 5 verse 14 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. It's no wonder that Paul says that you have what it takes to counsel one another. Because you are full of the goodness and the knowledge of God. You have the goodness, you have the knowledge of God, you have scripture, you have the Holy Spirit, you have prayer. Let me tell you, anyone that knows the Bible is filled with the Holy Spirit can counsel you. It's, a, it's, it's, it's much better than going to any counsel that does not know the word of God, does not know scripture, does not have the Holy Spirit, does not have a prayer life. You have what it takes to grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. There are people who want the counselor to fix their life. A counselor cannot fix your life. All a counselor can do is point you to Jesus Christ. But you must apply it to your life. And that's what people oftentimes don't want. They want the massage. They want to feel good. They want to continue living the way they live, but with the approval of someone. Oftentimes what people need is the willingness to change, even if it is hard. And that's hard work, to change yourself. So when you go to the Bible and you go to the Scripture, you, 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 you apply the Word of God, the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, there's prayer and all that, and the Holy Spirit reveals to you to change. You change. You must change. And that is hard. That is difficult. But it is there. The church has what it takes to counsel one another, to encourage one another, to admonish one another, to continue to grow in faith. Verse 15. Nevertheless, 
Brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The word minister in this verse is connected to the priestly duty of a priest. A priest every morning in the temple at twilight, morning and evening at twilight, would, would take a lamb and offer it up to the Lord as a sweet-smelling aroma to God. However, only the Jews could come into the temple. When this offering took place, the Jews could come in. If you were a male Jew, you could come in. You would come in through the courts of the, the women, and then you would come into the courts where the, the priest was. If you were a male, you could come up to there. If you were a woman, you would have to stay one, one section further out, where is the court of the women. Now, if you were a Gentile, you would have to be even further out. You couldn't, you couldn't, barely, couldn't even see it. And that was under the penalty of death. If you would, there was a sign over the door where, where going to the, the court of the women, there was a, there was a, there was a sign, if you, as a, as a Gentile, if you step over the threshold of this door, you will die. So that is how the Gentiles, they were kept further away. Paul now says, I have been given the ministry to offer up the Gentiles to God as a pleasing offering. Paul is saying is my ministry is to go and to share the gospel with the Gentiles. When they're saved, I give them over to God. As an offering, as a ministry to him. Now that's significant. I know that would have been very stretching for the Jews to see that. Do you mean a Gentile? That, that couldn't even enter the courts. He is now a sweet-smelling aroma and a, an offering to God. He's, that's, that's your ministry? That's my ministry. That's my ministry. God accepts the Jews. He accepts the Gentiles. He accepts all of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have, have, have everlasting life. It is for all. Salvation is for everyone. Jesus revealed this to Peter when he lowered that sheet from heaven with all these unclean animals. He was revealing to him, hey, the Gentiles are also accepted. Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, there will be one flock and one shepherd. One flock and one shepherd. Jews, Gentiles, one flock, and one shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. Paul says, that is my ministry. He says, verse 15, let's read it again. He says, um, nevertheless, brethren, I have been written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentile, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 15, he says, I am writing boldly on some points reminding you. I have the feeling that Paul is writing boldly. And he's reminding them. You need to be reminded the Gentiles are also part of this. And they are a sweet-smelling aroma. They are sanctified. Don't see them as unclean. And he's reminding them of that. I think that for Paul to write this, it must have taken a little bit of, well, I guess, boldness. Because of the culture, because of the way it was ingrained in the Jews. Paul said at one point, if it were possible, I would be willing to be accursed for my people. In other words, Paul loved his people. He loved the Jews. 
but the Jews had a real problem with the Gentiles. Remember when Paul, the last time he went, his third missionary journey, he came to Jerusalem and he brought Trophimus and, and one other guy to be sanctified. And they went into the temple, but the outer court, not the inner court. And then this rumor started spreading. It's a lie that he had, had brought people into the temple and defiled the temple, which was not true. And so they spread this lie about him. And then this uproar, they caused this uproar, it was all their intention to see if they could kill Paul. Well, the Romans came, they rescued him. And Paul says, can I speak with the people? And they brought him there in the Antonia Fortress, which is the garrison for the Roman military, the, the steps that would lead up to it. They brought Paul up on the steps, and he defended himself. He says, this is what's happened. And he shared how God had called him on his way to Damascus and had saved him and how he now had a call to the ministry of the Gentiles. They listened to him intently until he said that because the Jews refused the gospel, God now has sent me to the Gentiles. When he said that, there was an uproar. And they, they would have killed him if he wasn't protected from the, by the Romans. They hated it. And so Paul keeps hammering this point. And I think it would have been for Paul the temptation to recoil just a little bit. Maybe not be so bold on this Gentile thing in order to build his reputation among the Jews. I could see the temptation. Paul didn't do that. He was bold. He just stood the ground. He said, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches. This is it. I stand bold. I remind you of that. Even if it cost him his reputation among the Jews. He kept preaching. Paul was steadfast. This is a guy who couldn't move the guy. In Romans 8.35, it says, this is Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we were killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Think of going to a mission trip, just maybe to Placencia. Or go sharing the gospel here at the market in Cairo. That's an effort. But think about traveling thousands of miles from village to village, beaten, imprisoned, in hunger, and thirst, in shipwrecks, diseases, sickness, rejected, accused, and just kept going on year after year, decade after decade. I believe Paul was probably the greatest Christian that has ever lived, apart from Jesus Christ. What this man accomplished, and his steadfastness, steadfastness, and God used this man mightily, so much so that he wrote the most of the New Testament. But you couldn't move this guy. He just kept going on. He kept plowing uh, forward. Uh, at one point, he even came and he, he admonished Peter for caving in to the Gentiles, I mean to the Jews, because the Jews didn't like it. They didn't like the Gentiles. So he, he kind of recoiled a little bit and stopped eating with the Gentiles, and he went again with the Jews in order to, to build his own personal reputation, and Paul just said, that is wrong. That is wrong. He rebuked him. So it's a man that you can't move. It's a man that just stood his ground, and he kept preaching the gospel. So... His ministry was to bring Gentile to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice, as a, really as a priest. The word ministry here is, is the word priest, just like a priest in the temple. But what's interesting is that when a Gentile becomes a Christian, Paul as a priest now hands him to Jesus Christ, but that Christian now also becomes a priest. We are all priests. We don't need a mediator between us and God today. We don't need a priest in that sense. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God 
through Jesus Christ. We are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. All of us, you are a priest to Jesus Christ. You do not need someone as a mediator. You don't need Mary or some pope or some pastor or anyone to mediate. You can storm into the throne of grace, into the holy of holies, because the veil was ripped when Jesus died on the cross. We have access to Jesus Christ directly. Verse 17, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. And mighty signs and wonders by the power of Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem around about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard, they shall understand. Now, verse 17, he says, Therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. What it means is that Paul gives glory to God for, for his call in his life. It's not an easy call, but he gives God glory for it. It's interesting that Paul never complains. You don't hear a single complaint in Paul's life in all his letters. But rather we see him praising God, always giving glory to God. You could imagine him opening up the, the Bible, the, his epistle, and saying, man, you know, I was beaten and I'm here in pain and uh, I, I, you know, I don't have enough to eat. And you could, you, could ha you could imagine the complaints. Just the emotions setting in when a person becomes hungry, the emotional effect that has on a person. You don't know where your next bite is going to come from. You don't see any of that. It's incredible how God used Paul. It always reminds me of this saying that someone once said, uh, it is doubtful that God can use any man greatly unless he has hurt him deeply. And I think that we see some of that in Paul's life. I think he probably lost his wife and his family once he became a Christian. So he was ostracized even from his own family. And uh, he just kept plowing on. He just kept preaching the gospel. He had nothing to lose. Jesus Christ was his goal. Jesus Christ was his zeal. And uh, he lived for one thing only, and that is to please his master. And so Paul says, I do not desire to build on another man's foundation. What that means is that Paul did not want to continue another man's ministry. He didn't want to just uh, pastor another person's ministry that he already grew, uh, planted, another church. He, he wanted to be on the pioneer frontier. That's where he wanted to be. He wanted to go where no one had gone to preach the gospel and not build an, an existing ministry. Now, he says here that has, in verse 19, he has gone to Illyricum. Let's read verse 19. And mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now later on, further down, down he will see that, say that he desires to go to Spain. If you look at verse 28, Therefore when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Now I have a map here on the... Uh, that he can show you, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of what Paul is talking about when he talks about Illyricum, and he shared the gospel there. If you look at Israel down here, um, Paul was from Tarsus, which is just a little bit up further up, uh, where he was born, and, and the sea, uh, a sea a town or city. But Israel... He traveled his first missionary journey, was a smaller journey. The second one was bigger. third one was even bigger. Um, and then what Paul desires is to, after he's come to Jerusalem, he's now, he's writing to Rome, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem where he's going to deliver a gift that he has gathered for the church in, in, uh, 
the Gentile church. He's, deliver, he's collected some funds for the church. And once he's done that, he wants to travel up and he wants to go to Rome, which is over here. And he wants to visit them. And after he's visited them, he wants to travel and go to Spain. So that, that's his longing. That's his desire. But Illyricum is this area here. So Paul says, I've been in this area and I preached the gospel here. So I guess it would have been the furthest kind of the furthest out of the northern frontier of, of, of the Roman Empire at the time. Paul says, I've gone all through this entire area preaching the gospel. And uh, if you do the, just uh, measure the distance from Israel coming up here, then this way it's 1,400 miles. One way, so that's Paul traveling. Not on a high-speed train or an airplane or but, but mostly by foot and uh, boat. But the man traveled intensely preaching the gospel. And God worked powerfully through him. It says here through signs and wonders. Now God allowed these miracles in the Bible because they authenticated the message. They confirmed that the message was true. Jesus came and he did all these miracles. What that did is it confirmed that Jesus indeed was the Messiah because the Bible in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah came he would open up the eyes of the blind that the lame would walk and that's what Jesus said it authenticated ah this is the guy that the Old Testament talked about and he is the Messiah Paul the Apostles they did signs and wonders as well Paul's handkerchief he was just able to touch people at some point and, and they were healed but they followed the Word of God they didn't precede the Word of God today you might have someone oh let's have an evening of signs and wonders no that, that's not biblical that's not don't even go there that's not biblical the focus should always be the Word of God now, God at some point might do miracles. I think God doesn't do more miracles today because he can't. He doesn't want to because if he does, someone will receive the glory. Someone will receive, oh, you know, can you, so-and-so did this and that. And man, he healed this man. And, and, the, and then the evangelist or whoever it is receives the honor and the glory. So God just doesn't do it. I think God, sometimes God is restrained because of that. Because of or, I guess, Tendency to elevate people. That, that could be one point. But I think the other one is that we have the Word of God today. We have the full canon of Scripture, something that they did not have in Paul's day. And, uh, and so someone might say, so how can we prove that this man's message is true? They didn't have the Scripture. So God confirmed it by signs and wonders, by miracles. So people could see it that this is truly something out of the ordinary. And we need to pay attention to what this man is saying. Verse 22, For this reason I also have been much hindered from coming to you. Now that's an interesting verse. Well, let's continue verse 23. It says, But now no longer having a place in these parts and having great desire these many years to come to you. Paul says, I've been wanting to come to you, but I have been hindered. There have been times in the Bible where we read that Paul was hindered. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, it says, For a great and effective door has opened to me, but there are many adversaries. Paul says, pray for me. I have a great door open. There's this, this frontier, of, of, of this area where nobody's heard the gospel. It's open, but I'm being hindered by the enemy. Pray for me. But we see that Paul was hindered in Acts chapter 16. It says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Paul had a desire to go up north and east into Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, not, not, not there, not at this time. You need to go in a different direction. So he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. His, his hand, we could say, was held back because of that. I believe that the hindrance that it's speaking of here is not a hindrance that comes from the enemy or comes from, from Satan. This is a hindrance that simply comes from the great, effective, and open door that is in front of him. There are so many people who have never heard the gospel 
that Paul is being hindered. He, he, he keeps preaching the gospel. He's been wanting to go to you all these years, but I know you, you've already heard the gospel. So it's not the most important that I come to you. It's more important that I move forward in this frontier and pioneer and preach the gospel to people who have never heard. And I have been hindered because of that. But he feels that now the time has come for him to return to, to Jerusalem and then ultimately make it up to Rome. Verse 24, Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Notice Paul says, I'm, I'm going to just stop in. Uh, my, my goal is to go to Spain because the gospel may never have been preached in Spain yet. So I'm going to Spain, but because I'm going to Spain, I'm going to go by Rome anyway. So I'll just stop in and visit you. His aim was not those who already heard the gospel. His aim was those who had never heard. But since he was already traveling in that area, in that region, he would stop and visit them. For whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it has pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Paul had a desire to bring the church in Jerusalem a monetary gift. So as he's traveling from place to place, he's collecting money. He's collecting funds for the church in Jerusalem. Several reasons. One, well, Paul says here, they have given to the Gentiles spiritually. The gospel came through the Jew. The Messiah came through the Jew. The Old Testament scriptures were preserved by the Jews. The New Testament scripture is mostly written by the Jews. So Paul says the Gentile owes the Jews something, and really, in a, in a sense. They've given to you spiritually, so it's just right for, you, for them to give back monetarily. So for that reason, he brings some funds back. Secondly, the church in Jerusalem was in need. It had need because several reasons. One, after Pentecost, many of the people who had come there when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the church was born. Many of the people stayed in Jerusalem for quite some time. They didn't leave. And it drained the resources of the church. Secondly, a persecution broke out. Because of the church being formed and born and people beginning to worship Jesus and worship being on the Sunday, not on a Saturday, many of the people, much of the economy revolved around the temple. And now the Christians were kicked out of work. They didn't have work anymore. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees controlled the temple. And the work that went with it. So the Christians were now out of work, brought poverty to the church. And thirdly, on Paul's last missionary journey, coming back, there was a prophecy given by Agabus that, uh, that there would be a, a famine in the area. That could have played a part in that as well. So the church is in need back in Jerusalem, and Paul says, I can do something about that. I'll collect some funds. I'll go back to Jerusalem, and uh, I will bless them that way. I could also imagine Paul having persecuted the church for such a long time, and uh, before he was a Christian, actually killed some of these people, that he had a heart to bless them, to be a blessing to them, and bring some funds back to the church. And he says in verse 29, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the full blessing of the gospel of Christ. Verse 30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who are, do not believe, 
and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Now you see that Paul is kind of coming to the end. There's one more chapter, but he's winding down the book, this letter. But he has a prayer request. And that is that they pray for him, that they strive together with him. Paul says, you can be in this ministry together with me. The English word, uh, or, or let's put it, the English Bible translates it this way, being allies in the faith. Striving together, being allies in the faith. The Greek word implies to agonize together. It's uh, the same root word and when Jesus was in the garden. It says he agonized. And Paul says, you can do that with me. As I push forward to preach the gospel to people who have never heard, you can do that. And you can do that through prayer. Charles Spurgeon, writing of this, he said it this way. He said it's kind of like being let down by a rope. And then there's, there's some hole in the rope. And that's kind of what prayer is. As someone goes down into over the cliff and is hanging over the cliff in ministry, he's, he's, he's going to the frontier where no one has ever been. We can hold a rope. That's what Charles Spurgeon is saying. We can be part of it by prayer, by interceding for this person and asking for the, for the Lord to give him strength and to lead him and direct him. And that is the beauty of prayer, that you can partner with ministries anywhere in the world. And also what Paul desired was not just that they agonize with him and partner with him in ministry, but that, they, that he may be delivered from those in Judea, in verse 31. Paul recognized that there was danger in his travels, that he could that he could be killed. Back in Judea, what, he, what is he talking about? He's talking about the, the Jews. That he could be killed. It's almost like there was an omen already in him. Something was going to happen to him. And it's exactly what happened. He took Trophimus and the other guy with him. And they created this riot. Which was totally false. That he had brought people into the temple. And he was captured. And he was in prison for two years in Caesarea. Until eventually he appealed to Caesar and he, he was tried in Rome. But, but God was with, was with him. God preserved his life. He had a shipwreck on, the, on his way. And it's interesting that some scholars believe that the letter that would have condemned Paul was on that ship. And when that ship went down, so went the letter. And when Paul went to Rome, there was, there was no accusation. And he was, he was delivered. He was freed. Some think that after that he went to Spain. Church uh, tradition says that he did go to Spain after he was released. We don't know if that is true. But uh, he may have. And that his service in Jerusalem might be acceptable. That's another prayer that he has. Pray for me that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable. The church in Jerusalem always struggled with legalism. And Paul's bold mission to the Gentiles may, may, be, may not have been seen or taken very well. It, it seems that the church in Jerusalem, being so close to the epicenter of legalism, they always struggled with it. It was... It, they had a hard time breaking away from it. And Paul says, you know, I pray that when I come and I bring this gift to them, that they'll accept it. That, that it'll be pleasing to them and to the Lord. Verse 32, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Father, we thank you. For the book of Romans, we thank you for Paul, who was a man that was steadfast in his walk, who never wavered in his faith, a man who was willing to take such a beating physically in so many different ways, all for the gospel. And re we really here today owe uh, him, in a way, 
in that sense because of what he has done. And we give you thanks. We give you honor, Lord, for allowing people who went before us and who were faithful. And because of that, we are blessed here today. And I pray that our life, all of us here this morning, that our life might be lived in such a way that people who live out after us will be blessed because of us. So help us, Lord, to stand strong in our faith. It's a sweet-smelling aroma to you in Jesus' name.